So for the past couple of months I've been working on this project where I've been making the skeletal animation system in WebAssembly. And I posted a video along with this one where I go over what WebAssembly is, I cover the technology, and as I was working on that video I thought, hey, you know, maybe I should also talk about how I built this thing. Like what build steps that I actually used, because my other video, the one that I had planned for this whole time, was just a very high level overview. It was more of like a a before you actually go into using it, should I use this technology kind of thing. That was the big thing that I had in mind. But anyways, in this video I want to talk about just how I got my configuration up and running, uh, how I got everything connected, some of the code things that I actually did, and just walk you through a little bit of the actual code itself. A disclaimer of this, today, what is today? Today's the 15th, the 16th of April, 2017. And the technology is still very new, so a couple of the things are going to be a little bit different, especially in setting up the tools, and then there might be much better tools available now uh, when you're watching this video. I imagine that this exact thing is going to work going forward for quite a bit. The tools that I was using um, are pretty established, they're pretty good, they've been used for C++ to JavaScript compilation for a long time, and so I imagine they're going to be moving forward a really good tool for WebAssembly stuff as well. And then finally, yeah, and then also the version of WebAssembly that I'm on right now is the minimum viable product, but it is like the production WebAssembly. This is implemented in consumer browsers right now. There are features that are planned to come out in the future that I have no knowledge of, and they do not exist right now. So also just keep that in mind. Uh, the things that I'm doing, this is definitely in the beginning days of WebAssembly. There's probably a better way to do things by now. Anyways, so the first thing that you're going to need to do is download mscripten. And if you just Google mscripten, you have their GitHub page right there where you can grab that. The one that I went is on the actual... this isn't the page. Okay. I know on their GitHub page they have a link to it, and I can never seem to find it outside. Yeah, it's mscripten.org. I don't know if you can see that or not. Here it is. mscripten.org. I go to Downloading. Downloads, downloads, download and install the SDK. Now I'm running on Linux. Uh, they do also have a Windows and I believe, okay, the mass, Mac version is the same as the Linux version. But anywho, you just come here, you download it. I've already downloaded it. Let me pull that up and extracted it into this folder right here, EMSDK Portable. This is where I start to command line things just a little bit. Let me see if I can't make that any bigger. So now that I've figured out how to make that bigger, it should just be control plus. I don't know why it's not weird. Weird. Oh, there we go. It's because I also have to hold shift. Anyways, um, so I'm going to go into that directory. That's just emsdk portable where I have that. And there's a whole bunch of tools that you can, or there's a whole bunch of commands you can run against this emsdk thing right here. Uh, I believe you can see them all if you do help. Make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so right now the one that I want to use is the MSDK list. And this will show me, whoops, MSDK list. And this will show me the things that are currently available. Um, so the tools, the SDK versions here at the bottom is what I care about. Now, again, because this is super new technology, I'm going to be wanting to be on the SDK incoming 64-bit or SDK incoming 32-bit. I don't actually know if it matters, uh, 32 versus 64-bit. By the time you watch this, it's very possible that SDK master 32 or 64-bit works. So if what I'm talking about for some reason doesn't work suddenly, you should come back and consider, wait, how, what, what is today? Is it really far after that date that he was recording this video, that April 17th, 2017? Um, and if so, consider switching to the incoming. And I believe you can just do that. If SDK, what was the command? There was install, you have to install it, and then you activate it. Yep, so I would run em sdk install sdk incoming, um, yeah, sdk incoming 64 bit. Do do do, it goes through this, does all the checkouts, does a whole bunch of stuff. Anyways, I skipped ahead of all that just because I don't want to waste your time waiting for me. Uh, the, ne the thing you have to do after that is activate the same branch, that's SDK incoming 64-bit in my case. Boom, it's activated. This step takes a lot longer. The one before, 
is very possibly going to take a long time for you if you have to end up doing that. When I first ran it, it took the better part of an afternoon. I only have 8 gigs of RAM on my home machine, and my CPU is like a, you know, a 6-year-old Intel i3. Uh, so hopefully it's faster on yours. I know on my work computer when I tried this, it only took me like 45 minutes or so. Um, but it does take up quite a bit of stuff. Anywho, so we are now done with that. I'll just exit out of that. The text editor I use is Visual Studio Code. It's comparable to Sublime Text or Atom. They're very similar to each other. Um, I've been asked in previous videos like what text editor I use, so I guess I'll just get that out of the way right now. Uh, most of the code I'm not going to cover. I'm going to start off with the make file right here, where you can see the actual commands. Let me zoom that in just a little bit so everyone can see. Okay. So I have a few targets that I'm doing. First of all, I do want to make sure, I'll download that later. I want to make sure that I have some required node modules. The node modules that I need are Webpack specifically, I believe is the big one. Um, where is it? Okay, and also TS Loader and TypeScript because I do like to use TypeScript instead of vanilla JavaScript where I can. Okay, I have a couple of things that I build the demo app, this is just using Webpack to, um, wait a second, oh, okay, yeah, so I, I also have a Webpack configuration, so Webpack config JS. I'll be completely honest here, I usually use the Clojure compiler, I don't use Webpack very often, so it's possible this isn't perfect. Um, just showing this to show you, this is like a standard Webpack configuration, I'm saying I want a demo app, I also had some tests that I was writing that helped me debug a lot of the issues I had. I output them into my web root folder. Um, I use the TS loader and I don't load anything in the node modules. Resolve everything with the extension TypeScript. I want pretty much every TypeScript file that I have in my TypeScript directory. I want it uh, transpiled and packed together using this webpack. So that's what this does, is that just runs against the Webpack configuration to get the actual JavaScript built. The WebAssembly part that you are here to care about is this command right here, emcc, I go in, I have this folder cc, naive wasm animation manager, and this has the actual code. You can see I'm including another file right here, this math.h from my include directory. That's fine, the um, M script and compiler can figure that out. The, the commands for this are very similar to the, uh, the ones that you use for GCC, which is really nice. So I say I want to compile this file, I want optimization level 3. The dash s is to provide, oh, I don't know what you call it, just some sort of flag, some sort of variable, an environment variable perhaps, I guess, that goes into whatever. Uh, you use it to specify parameters that like are a little different. But, so the first thing is I say I want it to be a side module, so I just want the WebAssembly code, I don't want any of this overhead JavaScript around loading it and all that, I wrote that myself. And then this dash s webas wasm equals one, saying I want to use WebAssembly, I don't want to use like an output JavaScript file like mscripten is usually used for, historically. And then the output, I want webroot naive.wasm. And when I run that, it gives me this file right here, which is binary, let's see. Okay, I don't actually know how to show that, but believe me, there is a binary file that is all full of binary things. Uh, when I run this here, oops, what am I doing wrong? Oh, right, make app, that's the command that I have that runs clean node modules, downloads all that, Ugh. demo app, WebAssembly. So on mine, I think I have two versions of mscripten installed. And so I'm getting this right here. Again, if you're watching this far enough in the future that mscripten just natively supports WebAssembly on the master branch, then you're not going to have to see this. But something that I have to do right now is I have to go into that emsdk and say source. And I think it's emsdk environment.sh. Yep, press that. Pop D to go back into the directory that I was before. And if I make app again, now everything should run just fine. It builds the WebAssembly properly. Webpack gathers all my TypeScript files and puts them together. Okay, the first time that I run it in a session, it does do this. I think this is it just like running a configuration or checks or something like that. 
every time after that there's not nearly as much output. Yep, Webpack, it's building things, it's packing all these files together, EMCC is running, boom, we have our WebAssembly code. Cool, so that is the compilation. That is really all there is to actually compiling the WebAssembly. Um, let me close all of these so that we can see this better. So now for the actual C++ code that I wrote. This I modeled very closely after some animation code that I've written in the past in C++ just uh, for demos that I was writing. I did adjust it just a little bit. Let me actually pull up the .h file as well so that we can see these. Okay. So I have a couple of defines here. These are just some named constants that I'm using to denote different types of errors. These are, I do run some checks, like I run a null pointer check. Um, I don't actually use either of these, I don't think so, anymore at least. This extern function right here, this is a function that I have defined in my JavaScript that I will pass into here. Um, and so I use this to notify the JavaScript when I have an error. There's a callback that I wrote in JavaScript. Let me actually just pull up that file. Naive Wasson. Alert error. Right here. Okay. And I'll, I'll cover this all a little bit later. Um, but the actual alert error right here. This function saying extern void, I'm going to provide it somewhere else. This is the somewhere else that I've provided it. So you can see the, the types line up. I have three unsigned integers, 32 bits each. JavaScript, that's just numbers. And so I have which error code it is, what line number it's occurring on, and any extra information I want. I give a console error. During normal execution, you never actually see that. But I wanted to show that that is how you write in C++ something that you are going to provide from your JavaScript code. Going on, this is all very skeletal animation specific stuff that I don't really want to go into here. One trick that I have that I am going to point out that is really nice, this preprocessor definition right here, underscore, underscore, line, that is two underscores next to each other, um, turns into the actual line number of the source file. And so if I ever do output these, I get like 29 when this one's output, and this one will output 30, and this one will output 31. So it's easy to go back to my C++ code and inspect that. Let's see, I think this is all skeletal animation stuff right here. Yep, so you don't really have to know too much about this. Yeah, here is the actual public interface that I'm going to be calling from my JavaScript. This is worth pointing out. Notice the X turn C. This does not necessarily mean that this is strictly C code, though I think as a happy coincidence it is mostly strictly C. I'm doing a couple of things that C doesn't like, like initializing and using it the same place in the for loop, but um, what this mostly does is this gets the names right, because C++ has a nasty habit of mangling names, so this doesn't turn into get animated note transform after compilation. It gets turned into like underscore V7 capital K X whatever get animated no transform like there's a whole bunch of stuff that's attached to it and that just has to deal with the fact that you can overload names um, so that the symbols in the compiled files are still like properly unique I suppose uh, long story short this just prevents the name mangling from happening the X turn C and then in curly brackets you put all the functions that you actually want to use in your WebAssembly and you can see one example of where I use that dot get single there is still the underscore see so it, it is still prefaced by a single underscore you have to use that underscore there but right here when I'm calling this dot exports dot get single animation that is actually calling this function right here you can see that I take a pointer to a 4x4 four four matrix type which I have defined in my math dot h it looks like just like this it's just an array of 16 floats is all a math 4 type is I take that as a pointer, that's what is going to be the output of this function, uh, the result buffer is what I called that. If I was following a good naming convention, I'd do like O underscore uh, to denote that, oh, this is something that's output. As my inputs, I have an animation and a model, both pointers to things that I've established before time and a float animation time. I'm going to cover this a little bit later, but I have this this.next memory open in my WebAssembly TypeScript that pretty much just points to the position in the memory that is the next available location and because I'm allocating everything on a stack everything after next memory open is going to be completely open and free 
The couple of next parameters, I'm getting the addresses of the passed in animation and model. Uh, these are going to return numbers. And again, I'm going to get to this later um, when I cover how to connect the JavaScript to the C++. But let's see. I think that's everything important about this file. The .h file, I did want to point out how I structured my structs. Everything here is a struct. You can use classes, and that is just fine. Classes behave the same way as structs. I did not for this example, just because it helped me to keep the code uh, more in line between the C++ and JavaScript, because the math types that I use in the JavaScript just had data members. They didn't really have any functions that did comp um, deformations on them so much or at least I didn't really use them as such in the animation system. Um, so, you know, just structs with data members, I didn't really have to worry about alignment or anything like that. XYZ, XYZ, W. Uh, and I just want you to note types, variables, they're just very nicely packed together like that. There's no weird bools or um, stuff floating around. The exception is these more complicated ones, where I did have, like an animated bone has an unsigned int ID, an int position keyframes, a pointer to a position keyframe, which is going to be the position channel, or rather an array of position channels. In WebAssembly currently, it is 32-bit, so the size of a pointer is going to be 32 bits as well, 4 bytes, uh, the same size as a uint32. Um, that is going to be something that is going to be important later in this video. Yep, so other than that, just like, um, yeah pointers to other types, things like that. Everything is just numeric types. I don't have any strings. I don't have any C strings. I don't have any vectors. Uh, I probably could have included vectors. One thing that I did notice is even in including like C math, some of the functions, like I use an F mod somewhere, probably over here, F mod. When I was running this by itself, even though it's defined in C math and it's used in C math, I still had to provide some internal function that was used here in implementation for it uh, just because of the way all the linking and compiling worked. I suspect the reason for that is because some of these standard template library stuff actually make assembly calls and WebAssembly and x86 assembly or ARM assembly are going to be different from each other. Um, so a couple of the math functions I did have to implement myself. So the fmod specifically right here, fmod f. That's right. That's the one that it was complaining about when I tried to compile it. So I had to make an a cosine f sin f, f mod f. Kind of annoying, kind of, in my opinion, defeats the purpose because now I have to go back and like, okay, what's the 64-bit version of this float that I'm trying to use? Get the result, translate it back into a 32-bit float. But whatever. Okay, so that's the C++ side. Let's get into the TypeScript just a little bit where we talk about how to use it. The actual API I have here in the load method. Uh, I have a couple of helpers up here, which I guess are worth explaining. I have the WebAssembly module, which is going to be the actual WASM file, the binary that's parsed and put through the WebAssembly API that browsers provide. Uh, it starts out as null because I am going to have to do some asynchronous stuff in order to get that loaded. Exports, this is going to be the exports from the C++ file. So that's going to be everything inside this extern C. This is all going to be compiled and kept the same name, um, just with an underscore in front of it. And it also, I believe, compiles all of this stuff, but it name mangles the names a bit. So don't have to worry about that so much. I suspect there is a way to specify which functions you want to export. I don't actually know what that is, and um, I haven't really done enough investigation either. This demo was kind of small, so I didn't really care. Um, but that might be a thing. Okay, and then this memory. This is an interesting one. This is the shared memory between TypeScript, or JavaScript, I mean, and the WebAssembly code. Uh, it is to be used primarily by the WebAssembly code. However, because of the security model of the browser, this has to fit entirely within your JavaScript. So all of the memory you're going to have access to is going to be in this WebAssembly memory buffer right here. Um, so buffer overflows, they're not going to happen. It's just going to, everything's going to be in here. You can't deference a pointer that's outside of this range. This next memory open, this is, I'm just keeping a pointer, as you will, to the beginning of the heap, or yeah, to the beginning of the heap as it's available for use. I'm just allocating memory as it goes. So if I am at, if my next memory position is exactly 2000, and I allocate a four 
byte float, then it will be 2004, will become the new next memory open. And so I just keep advancing down this list, more or less, and allocating on that spot. Okay, uh, because the stack and heap in C++ are shared on this memory, I did start at the one megabyte position. Um, that just gives me one megabyte of stack space, so that all these variables right here don't accidentally overwrite my heap variables. That is one thing that I kind of wish... Well, I don't know what I wish. I was going to say I kind of wish that it was more obvious, but... I mean, I suppose that makes sense, so just that's a gotcha that I had. Hopefully it doesn't get you, too. Great. Let's see. Okay. This was just translating some strings into numbers um, because I was using JavaScript strings in the JavaScript implementation of this. Um, but WebAssembly, it's just a whole lot easier if you only use numbers. Try to avoid using strings and C strings if at all possible. That uh, just makes things a lot easier, at least as I discovered. You can absolutely write some boilerplate around translating between JavaScript strings and C strings, but if you don't have to, just don't. Overhead, whatnot. These two are also important. I had JavaScript animation and JavaScript model data things that were replicated in the WebAssembly heap, and I needed a pointer to each of them if they were provided. So this map will take in an animation that ha from the JavaScript, and it will return the pointer to that animation in the WebAssembly code. Great. That out of the way. To actually instantiate the WebAssembly module, what I'm doing is I'm using the fetch API. Just say, this pretty much does a get request for naive.wasm. You could do the same thing with an XML HTTP request if you want to go through those hoops. Uh, fetch is easier, in my opinion. I get the response. I want to get it as an array buffer, so I'm parsing it as binary, essentially. The bytes that I get, I pass it into this WebAssembly.compile. This gives me a module, the WebAssembly module. And in this point, this is where I know that things are actually kind of serious, that I'm getting ready to instantiate my WebAssembly module. Think of this WASM module as the class. This is not the instance of the class, this is the class. Um, this is the definition, so I can create instances based on this definition of my WebAssembly module that I want to use. Okay, so I define how much memory I want to use. I'm initially using 512 blocks. Each block is 64 kilobytes, if I recall correctly, which I don't really care to do that math. It's a handful of megabytes, like 16, I believe. Um, and this is going to be the size and all the memory that I can use. You can grow it. I did not for this example. I also have to provide it with some imports, this object of imports which has one object, this env environment, if you will. Memory base, where does the memory start? Zero, table base, table start, zero, memory. I gave it this memory object. Notice I kept two references to it. I will not be able to get a reference to the memory from the WebAssembly instance. And I'm only keeping one instance, so I just pass it my one memory object. Table, I don't really care about accessing the table, so I give it just a new WebAssembly table object. This also takes two two things. This is all, by the way, documented very well on the Mozilla Developer Network, so um, if you're wondering more detail about what any of these mean, go check that out. I have this initial object, as well as the element any funk. I don't know why it has to be any funk, but right now it actually has to be the string any funk. These four right here, these are functions that are going to be used within the C++, so I have an a cosine f. I path it Pass, blah, blah, blah. pass it math.a cosine. This is the JavaScript function that performs an a cosine on a number. It has the same um, signature as the one in C++, except for JavaScript uses 64-bit floats, where I'm using 32-bit floats for everything, so a little bit of type coercion is going to happen. Same with the sine f and f mod f. Um, but these are some math functions that I had to use. And to show you what happened when I didn't happen, have them, Initially, when I was trying to build this, I was getting an error that looked like this. That looked like this. That looked like, oh. And now I'm suddenly not. So it is very possible I did not actually need those. Oh, right, 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 right. Never mind. Um, I actually have to run this, don't I? Okay. HTTP server is the one I like to use. I think it's on 8,000 by default. 8080. Okay, that's right. It's a JavaScript error that I get. Do, do, do. Okay, this is the JavaScript error that I get. Let me try to zoom that in so you can actually see it.
So you're going to get this kind of error sometimes um, if you need to import something extra. I was saying fail to load native live WASM module, link error WebAssembly instantiate. So the WebAssembly it's instantiate function is this one right here. This is what was throwing the error. Um, function import requires a callable. Where was it? Okay. Import number one module equals env. Function equals a cosine f. Error function import requires a callable at fetch dot then then then. Uh, bottom line thing you want to take away is this. I'm missing an a cosine f. So I put that in there. That's my a cosine function. My arc cosine, inverse cosine, whatever you want to call it. I build that back in. Things should build properly again. And there we go. No more errors. Everything's fine. Wait a second. Yeah, everything's fine. Every Everything's hunky-dory. Great. What was I doing? Right, I want horizontal. OK. So that's something you might run into. You probably will run into. Um, hopefully not very often. Again, th again, this is why I was kind of shying away from using things like vector types, because I didn't know what other things I was going to have to declare. Um, so that is one problem of WebAssembly. And I think there are ways to get around that, and there are ways that are in the pipeline to get away around that. So good news. Anyways, so I make this big import object that has everything the WebAssembly module is going to need that I need from my C++ code. And I return the WebAssembly.instantiate, which module am I using as my, or my definition, I suppose, and the imports object specifically for um, what I'm going to be using for this instance. I gave this a really bad name. I said this Wasm module. This should be Wasm instance. Um, I'm sorry. But I save off a reference to the module that we've just instantiated. I save off the exports. This exports is a getter. Um, and so every time you actually say Wasm module.exports, it's going to run some function to get it. So I think it's just a good idea to save off so you're not constantly running another function. Uh, this right here was for debugging. You can just kind of ignore that. Cool enough, I had any errors. I do a console error. Fa failed to load naive wasm module. Uh, you'll notice I'm using the word naive a lot. That's because these are not super optimized. Um, I'm just using like the standard simple implementation of skeletal animation. Great. So let's talk about how I actually serialized the data. So a good example of that. Okay, let's do let's do an animation because that one is going to be more interesting. So what I do right here is I just make sure we have actually loaded the module. This is more just to make the TypeScript compiler happy than anything. Um, I register the bones. This is a function that I wrote. This is just to make sure that all of the strings that the skeleton uses have been translated into bone IDs, unique ones, based on what string it is. P animation address. In this code, I have been using the kind of Hungarian notation style thing to do, where I put a lowercase p in front of things that are pointers. Uh, I'm actually going to go on a little rant about this really quickly. Hungarian notation, I think it was Joel, like the Joel on Software blog that talks about this. Um, a lot of people really hate on it because they say, oh, your type information should be attached to the variable. Like, you shouldn't, it should be the compiler's job, not the person naming your variable's job to determine what type it is. And it's not really like type information, it's what kind of variable. This is a pointer. So it's a number, but I want to use it as a pointer. I want something to be obviously wrong. Like if I would say time equals p animation address, I want this to obviously be wrong just looking at it. And so anyways, Hungarian notation is actually not that bad. You should totally use it for things like this. I digress. JavaScript doesn't have a pointer type, so I'm saying this is a pointer. Rant over. So I'm saving off the pointer to what this create animation data returns. This animation address is set for this animation that we're passing in. It is, its address is this pointer right here. If you go to this create animation data, this is where things get interesting. Again, making TypeScript compiler happy, make sure that we actually have a memory instance. Uh, this is just more safety checks saying like, um, make sure that we have registered this animation, that we know what all the bone names are. This could have been done inline whatever. 
So if I go over math.h, this is what's going to have the actual definitions of the types. So p animation, whoops, yes, animation right here. So what I'm doing right here is I'm saying, where was I? I was right here. Uh, the pointer to the animation data equals this dot malloc, the size of a single float, times the size of four unsigned integers. And you can see over here I have a single float and four unsigned integers, two in the form of actual unsigned integers, and two in the form of pointers, which are unsigned integers. The malloc function is just a little quick thing. Again, this was a super simple implementation. All I was saying for malloc is pointer equals this next memory open, increment the next memory open by the size that you want to allocate, and then return the pointer that you have right there. So, okay, apparently I lost my place, but uh, I didn't implement free, again, because all of the data used was for the entire lifetime of the application. Let's see, and it was called create animation, right? Yes, yes, here we are, okay. So I malloc the size of this animation struct, and I say it's at that spot. I get a float32 array to the this memory buffer. This is going to be one giant array buffer that has the entire C++ stack and heap contained within. I want to get a view at this pointer, so what is the address? And I only have one float, so this is just, again, a, a safety thing to make sure that I don't accidentally overwrite my bounds. This is for me, the programmer, not for um, the compiler as much, though I imagine this does make it so things can be more optimized. Good practice in any case. I say I want to write one float 32. I set that element to the duration of the animation. That sets this variable over here. And then for the uint, I want to do a similar thing. I want to get at this memory buffer, p animation data plus float size. So I want to start my memory writing not here, but here at the second element in the struct. Notice that I am doing it just in order. In C++, when you make a struct and it has data elements in it like this, they will be packed in the order that you write them. So this duration will be first, static bones, static bones, num animated bones, animated bones. These will be at bytes 0, 4, 8, uh, 12, and 16 respectively. So I set the number of static bones at position 0 to animation.staticbones.size and likewise at animation uint view 2 to the number of animated bones. Again notice I'm starting at the location of the animation offset by the size of a float. For the actual static bones I go through and I allocate each static bone so I have to create a list of these things now. So I go through for each of them again TypeScript safety things um, along with redundant checks. Uint view. Uint, I need, for a static bone, I need two unsigned integers in the form of an ID and a parent ID. And then I need a matrix, which is going to be just 16 floats, if you recall correctly, uh, for this transform variable right here. So I grab those buffers right here. The uint view. I'm grabbing two unsigned integers. And this actually, I believe, should just be two because it already knows the size of that. So that's a little bit of a bug right there. I say the ID is going to be the bone IDs.get, and the parent ID is going to be the bone parent, that bone ID, or root node. Root node is always zero. Okay, and then the float view I set, I serialize the map four um, for the transform. The serialize map four, that just returns the data in the JavaScript types. I guess I'll actually go there. Um, I just have a float32 array that stores the actual data for these numeric types. Great. And you can see for each one of, um, for that first one I'm saying like I'm allocating the size of a static bone, which I have set to a constant somewhere up above, uh, where it's just size of two unsigned integers plus the size of a matrix, whatever that is. Um, this is going to be contiguous memory because I did that. That is how C arrays work as well. I go through and I just set them. I do the same thing for the animated bones, except for that requires one further level where I go in and I actually allocate arrays of uh, position keyframes, rotation keyframes, and scaling keyframes like, along with the numbers. If I go back after I've created all those, I can come in here and I can say, okay, my, I guess I can point it out right here too. Um, for the actual animation, in the uint, which is these four, 
the second element at index 1, that is, is going to be uh, a pointer to this array of static bones. So this thing that I got from malloc, I set that pointer right here. Likewise for the animated bones pointer right here. So if you are familiar with memory layout and all that, that might have just been the most boring 15 minutes that you watched out of this whole thing, but that is how I'm translating the data. Uh, again, as long as you're meticulous about how you do things and you're not careless and just go too fast, like you actually give this the due consideration, it's about 150 lines of TypeScript. It's really not that much code uh, that goes into setting that memory in, um, in the TypeScript code. Let's see. I think that is everything important about the WebAssembly stuff. I'm not going to go over the fundamentals of character animation or how that works. I'm not going to go over uh, the vertex shader that I used to get this all to work. There is a much better tutorial on how to do that that I will put a link to in the comments. You should absolutely check that out if you are curious. But I'm pretty sure I am done here. Uh, I guess I will just flash up really quick the definitions for WebAssembly that I used. These are definitely not perfect. I just pretty much put them in there so that TypeScript wouldn't complain. Um, take a look at them. TypeScript things, aren't they glorious? They're great. Compile, instantiate, memory, table. Awesome. Cool. If you have any further questions, let me know in the comments. Um, if it's like, if there's something that is just totally confusing about this, it is very possible the technology has changed by the time you're watching and that there is a better way to do it. There's more tooling, whatever. I just wanted to talk about how I got all this to work. Um, I feel like I owe that to you all, the watchers, the viewers. So, cool. Thanks for watching.